Today, we will be talking about the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So everything that we learned so far has led to the electron transport chain. Uh, recall in the last video we were talking about the uh, TCA cycle. Well, the whole purpose of the TCA cycle was to create uh, coenzymes, right? So we were reducing NADH, uh, excuse me, we were reducing NAD plus and reducing FAD and we created NADH and FADH2. Now those coenzymes will be entered into the mitochondria. Uh, specifically, they will enter into the, uh, the matrix, right? So they enter the matrix and they're gonna be doing reactions in the inner membrane. Then they will be creating hydrogens, which are just uh, gonna be pushed into the, in the uh, inter membrane space, right? And then afterwards, those hydrogens and the inter uh, membrane space are going to flow downwards back into the matrix and they will create ATP, right? So again, the co uh, cofactors generated by the TCA cycle are going to do reactions. They create hydrogens in the inner membrane space. Those hydrogens flow back into the matrix and create ATP. Of course, whenever they're creating ATP, we will call this, uh, we will call this process uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And of course this only occur, uh, occurs whenever there is oxygen. Okay, so this is going to be an aerobic an aerobic process. And so some textbooks might call this uh, mitochondrial uh, respiration. And so the consumption of ADP into ATP, you know, the conversion, only occurs when there's oxygen in the system, right? So notice that oxygen has to be present in order for ADP to convert into ATP, right? So ATP has three phosphate groups. ADP only has two phosphate groups. Therefore, we have phosphorylated, meaning added a phosphate group onto the ADP. Right? So that can only occur when there's oxygen, making it an aerobic process. You're probably wondering, well, you know, how are we going to get hydrogens from NADH and FADH2? Well, notice that there are going to be some, uh, some, some proteins right here, right? So these are intermembrane proteins, meaning that proteins uh, go across the membrane space, right? So they're inter. And these are going to be called complexes, right? So these are uh, complexes, and there's about four of them. Now, you only see three of them because the second one isn't really uh, considered a complex, per se. It just generates the electrons. We'll get into that later. So I'm just going to add a little square, okay? So that's going to be the second complex. So this is going to be complex one, uh, two three, and these are in uh, Roman numerals, right? And this is going to be complex four. Now, some textbooks consider this one uh, to be complex five, right? So some of them consider this complex five. Other textbooks and most people say that this is ATP synthase, and that's totally fine. I agree with that, okay? And so these proteins are located in the inner membrane space, and they take these uh, cofactors, NADH, FADH2, and they do a series of reactions, we'll, which we will uh, cover in this video, and they generate hydrogen ions or hydrogen atoms in the intermembrane space, right? And then that creates a gradient, which has uh, a voltage, which we'll cover as well, and those hydrogens will enter ATP synthase, and they will do a series of reactions to generate ADP into uh, ATP, right? So they're going to generate ATP. So the whole process of creating cofactors and and whatnot is to uh, create ATP, right? And now you're probably wondering, well, you know, why is a mitochondria folded, 
Why is the membrane so folded? Well, if you fold the membrane, you're gonna have more surface area to work with, right? So if this was just a circle, you wouldn't have as much space in the mitochondria. But if we fold the membranes, you know, you can have reactions occurring here, 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 more reactions than uh, originally, right? So that's why the mitochondria is folded in such a way. It, it's folded because you want to have more area to work with. So now, before we uh, move on, we should say that the electron transport chain occurs in the inner membrane, right? So the ETC, electron transport chain, occurs in the inner membrane. So where does oxidative phosphorylation occur? Oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the uh, in the ATP synthase, right? So we have oxidative phosphorylation occurring in the ATP synthase. Now let's briefly talk about the ETC before we get right into it. So what exactly is occurring? Well, what happens here is that NADH is going to enter uh, complex one and is going to do a series of reactions and essentially is going to release NAD plus, right? So notice that NAD, oh, and this is uh, occurring for FADH2, right? So FADH2 is going to enter complex two and out comes FAD. So notice that NAD plus and FAD, well, they're in limited supply in the system. You don't really get a lot of those. And so you're gonna recycle it and put it back into the uh, TCA cycle, right? Or back into the system, right? So NAD plus and FAD, they are recycled. You're probably wondering, well, you know, where do uh, these hydrogens go? How, how are they um, oxidized? Well. Yeah, these guys were oxidized. And you're probably saying, well, if something was oxidized, then something else has to be reduced. Well, that is true. See, these electrons are transported into the oxygen. Now, you can't really see it, but there's an oxygen right here. Um, specifically, it's half, uh, uh, well, specifically, it's, it's an oxygen by itself, right? So normally, um, gas oxygen is O2. But here, in the mitochondria, oxygen is just a single oxygen atom, right? So it's just O. And so these electrons are going to be uh, connecting to the uh, oxygen, right? And that will actually uh, reduce the oxygen, and it will create water, right? So as you can see here, we have half of the uh, oxide, right? So half oxide is just O2, so half of 2 is 1. So we have one oxygen is going to be reacting with the electrons that are transported, and it's going to be reduced into water, right? So these guys, electrons, electrons reduce O. So on the exam, if it says, oh, it re reduces O2, no, that's wrong. It reduces a single oxygen atom, right? Reduces O into H2O, right? So it creates oxygen and create, um, sorry, it reduces oxygen into water. And this is actually the source for uh, metabolic water, right? So this water is gonna be used in the TCA cycle, you know, uh, to do some reactions. Do you remember that some reactions needed water uh, to do uh, the process? Well, that water came from the uh, mitochondria, okay? So it came from these reactions. And so the main takeaway of what I just said in like three minutes is that, let's, let's write it down because it's very important, okay? We, we have that NADH enters complex one. So we're gonna call this complex, complex one, right? Now FAD, H2 enters complex two, right? So that's complex two. Now, both of them, you know, NADH and FADH2, both of them are gonna be reacting with oxygen. 
So both of them react with oxygen. They have, like for instance, we have NADH, and then we're gonna add a hydrogen. You'll see why later. And then we're gonna add half oxygen, and that's gonna give us some H2O and ATP, right? So that's essentially what I just said, okay? And of course, we're gonna have ADP plus a phosphate group and is going to react uh, during this process, okay? However, is this process favored? Is the process of you know oxidizing NADH and FADH2 spontaneous? Is it good? Well, yeah, because actually this whole reaction, this whole reaction of what we're doing actually will give us a delta G, a delta G that is negative, okay, really, really negative. So it's spontaneous and therefore thermodynamically stable and favorable, okay? So thermodynamically stable. Thermodynamically uh, favorable. So here we go. Right, because the uh, created items, so NAD plus and FAD, they have a greater affinity for electrons. So for instance, think about this. Does NADH want to have more electrons? You know, if you have a, a pair of electrons next to it, is it gonna take it? No, but if you have a pair of electrons next to NAD+, well, yeah, it's gonna accept those electrons. And we want it to accept those electrons so it can use those electrons to create more ATP. Therefore, if we have something that creates ATP, and we can make it, well, that's gonna be really favorable. And so this whole process is thermodynamically stable. Now, let's actually dive deeper into that concept. As you can see here, as the NADH enters complex one and does a series of reactions until it reaches complex four, the delta G is increasingly uh, more negative, right? So we start with negative 69.5 kilojoules per mole as a delta G value, but at the end of the uh, electron transport chain, this becomes negative 112 kilojoules. So it becomes more uh, negative, right? So this is more spontaneous. Right, therefore this whole process is uh, thermodynamically favorable. But let's talk about voltages, right? Because that's a topic that professors really cover, right? So because you're creating an electron gradient, there will be some voltages involved, right? So re recall that um, hydrogens are charged, right? So they're positively charged. And in biology, uh, you will learn that all membranes have a charge on them. Right, so we're kind of uh, competing against the membrane charge and we're adding a positive charge. So what is the voltage, right? So let's cover that. Well, the voltage, let's call that EO, right? That's just a charge of a molecule. Do you agree with me on that? We will be talking about the molecules specifically and for simplicity, let's just uh, talk about NADH and oxygen, okay? And so, essentially, a molecule that has a low redox potential has a positive uh, voltage, okay? And therefore, um, if you have a positive voltage, you're going to be reduced, right? So, tell me, what molecule in this um, picture has a high voltage. Well, if you're looking at it, you would see that oxygen is going to be oxidized, right? I mean, sorry, it's gonna be reduced, excuse me, into water, right? So we can say that O is gonna be reduced into water. Therefore, we can say that since it was reduced, it must have low redox potential, right? So we have low redox potential. And if it has low redox potential, what is it going to be? It's going to be reduced. So to recap, molecules that have a low redox potential 
are reduced because they have a higher um, positive voltage, right? Now, what can we say about the opposite? What if something has a high redox potential? Well, look at this. We have NADH is going to be what? Oxidized, oxidized into NAD+. And so we can say that this has a high redox potential. And we can say that this is, um, is oxidized, right? So it's oxidized. And this one has a uh, low negative voltage. Let's, let's fix that. And so can you tell me whether the voltage on the oxygen is high or low? Is it positive or negative? Well, this actually has a high positive voltage, right? So there you go, right? And that means that as the electron transport chain continues in its reactions, we're going to be taking this, uh, well, let's make an arbitrary value. Let's say negative 0.38 volts, right? Or millivolts. So we're going to take this negative voltage and we're going to do a series of reactions and eventually we're going to put it at about, I don't know, 0.9 millivolts. So we change from a negative value into a positive value. And so on the exam, they could ask you, well, you know, is a change from a negative voltage into a positive voltage favorable? And you will say yes, because as the series continues, uh, the delta G value uh, continuously drops, so it becomes more negative, and that is more favorable. And so this whole process is a favorable reaction. What else can we say? We can say, we can say that NADH is the strongest donator. And we can also say that O is the strongest acceptor. And it makes sense to have NADH as the strongest donator because whenever it enters the electron transport chain, you want it to be donating its electrons so it could form the uh, hydrogen gradient and therefore create ATP. And you want oxygen to be the strongest acceptor so that it accepts those electrons from NADH and creates met uh, metabolic water, you know, and continues the uh, reaction. So you want that to happen. So now let's talk about something that is uh, pretty interesting, right? So these are going to be called uh, cofactors, right? So these are cofactors, cofactors in the electron transport chain. So essentially what happens here is that these complexes in the uh, inner membrane have some proteins, right? So they have a uh, some enzymes, excuse me, and these enzymes use cofactors to do their jobs, right? So you can think of the mitochondria as a factory. Now in this factory you have workers, which are the enzymes, and those little workers have tools that help them do their job, and the cofactors are the tools that help the enzymes do their job. Okay, so what are the cofactors made of? Well, these cofactors are made of metals. Okay, so they contain uh, metals or flavins. So either the cofactors have metals or the cofactors have flavins, and you'll see which ones are different. So the, of the metals, we could use uh, iron, an iron sulfur combo. Uh, we could use a copper uh, metal, and we can also use a pure iron, right? So if you just use pure iron, like in this picture right here, that is called a heme group, right? So this is called a uh, heme group, right? We can call that hemes. And they're pretty important. Uh, well, all of them are important because they can actually uh, carry electrons, okay? So when they carry electrons, they help facilitate the reaction, right? So flavin mononucleotide, FMN, well, this is in complex one. 
and it binds to NADH. So whenever NADH goes into complex one and it does reactions, it essentially it gives its electron to the flavin nucleotide, and then the flavin nucleotide carries the reactions uh, later, right? And so FMA, well, sorry, FMNH2 is going to occur in complex complex two. I should do that in Roman numerals, right? So this is complex two. So in a different complex, a different flavin reacts with FADH2, right? So FMNH2 reacts with FADH2. So if it looks similar, most likely it pairs with it. Okay, so that's all you really need to know. The two big cofactors for complex one and complex two are going to be flavin mononucleotide and FMNH2. Remember that cofactors, they just help get the uh, electrons from the, um, from the NADH and FADH2, and they just carry those electrons to the uh, next reaction. All right, but you know, sometimes the electrons need to go to a different complex and help out um, some ser some specific reactions. So how do we transfer electrons from one complex into the other? Well, we're going to be using mobile electron carriers. So this is mobile, right? So this is mobile electron carriers. We will. Th there's actually two of them, but we're going to talk about the first one and then move on to the next one. So the first one is called ubiquinone. So it's called ubi. We know. And it is given the letter Q. Okay? So this is also called coenzyme Q. And essentially all it does is that it functions as an electron taxi. That's all it is. It's a really cute taxi. So coenzyme Q has a low molecular weight, meaning that it can travel very fast and it's small, it's very you know, mobile, <laughs> and is also membrane soluble. Right? So, coenzyme Q is going to have a long hydrophobic tail, and that tail actually helps it to be anchored in the, uh, the membrane, okay? So, specifically the inner mitochondrial membrane. So, it has a long, long uh, anchoring hydrophobic tail, right? And it holds it, holds, uh, let's call that coenzyme Q. So holds, holds coenzyme Q in the inner mitochondria membrane, okay? So that's all that does, right? And so since it can pass through the membrane, Membranes are made of fats, right? Remember in the lipids video where I mentioned that membranes are made of fat? Well, if you use critical thinking, coenzyme Q is, sol is membrane soluble. Therefore, coenzyme Q is also lipid soluble. So we can say uh, lipid, lipid soluble. Okay, so let's, let's do a happy face there because that's pretty cute. It's pretty good, right? And so it can diffuse into the lipid bilayer, right? So now, what is it acting as a taxi for? You know, is it for complex three, complex four? No, no. It's actually acting as a, a, a taxi for complex one and two, right? Acts as an electron taxi for complex one and uh, two, right? And so these electrons that come out of complex one and complex two, they're gonna hitch a ride on coenzyme Q. And coenzyme Q are gonna transport those electrons into complex three. So transports, transports electrons, the E negative is just electrons, electrons from complex one and complex two and it's going to transfer it to uh, complex three. So now let's talk about the second uh, taxi, or I guess the mobile electron uh, 
and carrier, right? So the second one is going to be called uh, cytochrome C, right? And so cytochrome C is actually a peripheral, let's say furrow, right? A peripheral protein on the membrane, right? So peripheral protein membrane. And essentially, it's going to transport the um, electrons from complex 3 into complex 4. Right? And so when the electrons are transferred from complex 1 and 2, into complex three using uh, ubiquinone, those electrons are then going to be transported uh, via cytochrome C into um, from complex three into complex four. So we have like two taxis that are facilitating the transportation of electrons between complexes, right? And so complex one and two, they have to share a taxi. But complex three is so important that it only um, has its its taxi. So it's like a private um, mobile electron carrier, right? And uh, finally, it actually uses a hem group. So this uses uses a hem group. So in the middle of the structure, you you will find a iron. Uh, atom, okay, and that allows it to carry electrons. Now we will talk about the complexes in greater detail. Okay, so this is actually going to be complex uh, one, and complex one also has a really weird name, and that is called NADH, NADH, ubiquinone. Uh, oxyreductase. So this is oxyreductase. Uh, so it's kind of easy to remember, right? Just remember that complex one deals with NADH. It's going to be using a uh, ubiquinone as an electron transport, or I guess a uh, carrier, excuse me, and it's going to be uh, doing a redox reaction, right? So it's going to be oxidizing and reducing. So this is uh, a protein, so it's going to be ACE, right, like an enzyme. So it's oxyreductase, okay? And um, this includes, the well, complex one includes flavoproteins and proteins that have iron and sulfur. So it has, has flavoproteins. and proteins that have iron sulfur clusters and that helps to facilitate the reaction by accepting electrons okay so they're pretty important and essentially it's going to transport these electrons into co uh, coenzyme Q right so transports electrons uh, to coenzyme Q, also known as ubiquinone. Okay, So NADH is going to transfer two electrons and they're going to be in the form of H negative, right? So let's see, see over here, NADH uh, gives two electrons and these two electrons are going to be in the form of H negative, okay? And it gives these electrons to the proteins, right? And so this is actually going to reduce, reduces Q into QH2, right? So look at that. It's so amazing. It's so beautiful. Oh my gosh, right? Look, the ubiquinone or coenzyme Q is just, you know, it's waiting for its client. It's just a taxi driver. But now whenever NADH enters, it enters the complex one. So this is the matrix and this is where the gradient is going to be formed. As NADH enters the 
um, complex one is going to give off two electrons, right? And then the taxi driver sees that it has two clients and well, it says, well, you know, I need to afford food, so I have to do this job. And taxi driver, CoQ, is going to pair with those two electrons. And whenever it pairs with those two electrons, it will have QH2. And so whenever we gain hydrogen, specifically hydrogens, this is going to be a reduction reaction. So this is reduced. And look, over here, NADH loses hydrogens, right? We have a loss of hydrogens. And so that is going to be oxidation. And so on the exam, you know, they could ask you, well, is NAD um, positive, right? Does it have a high uh, redox potential? And you're going to say, yeah, it does have a high redox potential, meaning that this is really negative. Um, if something has a high redox potential, it's going to be oxidized, right? And if something has a low redox potential, it's going to be reduced. And therefore, this is going to have a positive voltage. Uh, let's call that voltage, and this is going to be a negative voltage. And so whatever is uh, reduced, you're just going to make it more positive. It's going to have a higher positive value. Okay, So that's all there is. So one of the most important things that you need to remember is that for complex one, for complex one, uh, four hydrogens are going to be generated into the gradient. So this is the gradient, right? So this is like our little fuel source that we're uh, charging up. So for every NADH, you will generate four hydrogen uh, atoms in the complex one. So we can say that complex one gives four hydrogen uh, uh, atoms per NADH, okay? So that's very important. You need to remember that, okay? Now we will be talking about complex two. Now complex two has a different name, right? So complex two, let's make that better. It's going to be called succinate Succinate ubiquinone oxoreductase, right? Okay, and and so it the reason why it's called succinate is because it functions the same as succinate dehydrogenase in the TCA cycle. Okay, so it functions functions the same. as succinate dehydrogenase. And remember that this was found in the TCA cycle. Essentially, in the TCA cycle, we have in step six, uh, succinate converting itself into fumarate. But whenever it, it converts itself into fumarate, it, it creates, um, well, actually, it actually um, oxidizes, right? No, excuse me, it reduces uh, FAD into FADH2, right? So succinate, when it converts to fumarate, is going to reduce FAD into FADH2, right? So that's going to create it. And now the dehydrogenase is going to direct this guy into complex two, and then is going to essentially um, oxidize itself into FAD. So let me draw a little picture right here. So this is a uh, complex two, and basically we have succinate converting itself into fumarate, and whenever that happens, it generates FADH two. And now the dehydrogenase that converted succinate into fumarate is going to direct FADH2 into complex 2 and therefore is going to uh, create is going to create FAD which is going to be recycled and is going to create some electrons. And so what happens here 
is that whenever the FADH2 converts itself to FAD, this is going to be called, this is called an oxidation. So what is the reduction? Well, the reduction occurs in two steps. The first step is that each electron, there are two electrons, are going to pair with the iron sulfur protein. Right, so there's about two iron pair proteins. So one electron pairs to one protein and the other electron pairs to another protein. Now these proteins, since they accepted electrons, they're going to be reduced. Right, and so the reduction occurs whenever this guy is going to be reduced into this guy right here. Okay, so that is a reduction. And now those little proton, oh sorry, those little proteins are going to kind of hand over those electrons into the taxi. Okay, so it's kind of like an extra strap, but it happens, right? Now the taxi is going to take those electrons and it's going to put them into the um, intermembrane space, right? So it's going to transfer them to complex three. But you should know, you should know that complex two does not, does not generate hydrogens, right? So on the exam, if they say, you know, complex two generates hydrogens, blah, 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 that's false. It does not. All it does is it acts like a little factory, right? And it connects the um, TCA cycle into the um, well, into the electron transport chain, right? So the TCA cycle is connected to the electron transport chain via complex two. So let's recap, succinate is going to convert itself into fumarate that is going to create FADH2. Now FADH2 is gonna be taken by the succinate dehydrogenase into complex two. Now FADH2 is going to be oxidized into FAD. That is going to release two electrons. Those two electrons are transported via iron sulfur Right, so that is going to be a reduction because when these electrons pair to the iron sulfur, they're going to reduce it. So there's another iron right here, right? So it's a reduction. And so these irons are then going to shoot off those electrons into coenzyme Q. And so enzymes, uh, sorry, and so the electrons are going to pair with the coenzyme Q and is going to be transferred into complex three where it can continue the reaction. So now in complex three, we will have kind of like the combination of ubiquinone with cytochrome C, right? So that's gonna be interesting. Now the name for complex three is called uh, ubiquinol cytochrome C oxyreductase. Now complex three, they're gonna have proteins, okay? And specifically these um, proteins, they're gonna be called uh, cytochromes, right? So cytochromes, they're gonna be acting as a center for redox reactions. Right? So where do they get their electrons from? They actually get their electrons from ubiquinone, right? So coenzyme Q, right? So from complex one and two, coenzyme Q has gotten electrons and now it needs to transport them to their destination, which is complex three. Now over here is going to do that um, curve, okay? So over here, uh, we have coenzyme Q is going to touch complex three and a series of reactions will occur. Now here we have that QH2 becomes Q, right? So we lost hydrogens. And therefore, since we lost hydrogens, we actually are going to be oxidized. Okay, so we're gonna have a low redox potential, right? And therefore that is going to be a positive voltage. Now, that, that um, two were oxidized, okay? 
So these two electrons are kind of meandering in complex three. Now, two cytochrome uh, complexes, right? They're gonna have a charge of plus three. Oh, and these use a uh, hem group, right? So that, that uh, cytochrome C just, um, they just use iron, right? So anyway, cytochrome C has a, um, a charge of plus three. And so two cytochrome C's are going to hit complex three, and they're going to react with the two electrons. And then the two cytochrome C's are going to have a value, a charge value, of positive two. So we went from a positive three value into a positive two. And so we reduced the charge value. So this is a reduction. And so we have two reduction reactions. Right, so we have an oxidation reaction, and then we have a reduction reaction. And so that is why these are called redox reactions, right? So for every oxidation reaction, we will have a reduction reaction, okay? So, complex three. So the most important thing that you need to remember is that complex three generates four hydrogens, okay? Generates four hydrogens, right, per um, QH2, right? So per QH2. Of course, these four hydrogens, two of them come from the QH2, and then two of them, um, essentially, they, they come from the uh, matrix, right? Right, so we can say that two come from um, matrix, which is inside the mitochondria, and then two come from um, QH2. Right, so why are we getting hydrogens in, from the matrix? Well, again, like a taxi, uh, taxis need gasoline, right, to actually function. If you don't have gasoline, you're not going to go anywhere. So similarly, uh, we need hydrogens from an external source to kind of facilitate this reaction. We need this to start up, you know? So I like to think of it as the hydrogens kind of fueling, kind of fueling this taxi, right? So this taxi is running out of gas. It did its uh, reaction, and it says, well, you know, I need some gas. I need to do more reactions. And so this hydrogen is like the gasoline. It comes from the matrix, it fuels the uh, coenzyme Q when it's resting, and then the coenzyme Q can go back into complex one and two and do more reactions, okay? So two of them, two hydrogens come from the matrix, and then two hydrogens come from the what? It comes from the oxidation, the oxidation of coenzyme Q. Finally, we will be talking about complex four, so complex four, it, that's going to be called uh, cytochrome, cytochrome C oxidase, right? So that is called cytochrome C oxidase. Let's put an exclamation mark right there. And it's actually a combination of cytochromes. Complex four has about 10 uh, proteins, right? So we can have like 10 protein subunits. You don't need to know them, right? It's not really important. But essentially the combination of cytochromes are cytochrome A and cytochrome A3. Uh, cytochrome, well, excuse me. So complex four is going to have about uh, two hem groups and about two copper groups. So like it's proteins, two of them will have uh, irons, and then two of those proteins are gonna have coppers, right? And so these are gonna be acting as centers for the redox reactions. And we have that two irons, they go from a positive three, and they're gonna be reduced into a positive two. What about the coppers? Well, the coppers, they're going to be reduced from a positive 2 into a positive 1, right? So it's just copper positive. 
So where are we going to get our electron source from? Well, we're going to get our electron source from the taxi, right? So remember that we have cytochrome C, right? And so essentially that is, you know, our electron source. Now the electrons are going to react with complex four to give about two electrons. Now in the matrix, we have one oxygen and that oxygen is going to be paired with two hydrogens, right? Now, when they're paired with two hydrogens, they're going to hit complex four and they're going to react with two electrons. Remember that these electrons came from the cytosol C, right? And therefore, it will create uh, metabolic water, okay? So essentially, this is the uh, reduction and this is the oxidation. So that's the oxidation, right? So that's a redox reaction. And uh, remember that cytosol, or excuse me, that cytochrome C is linking, is linking uh, complex three to complex four, right? So we got the electrons from complex three into complex four. Now only uh, cytochrome A and cytochrome three can actually um, directly oxidize uh, oxygen, okay? So only cytochrome A and A3 can directly oxidize oxygen, okay? Very fun to say. But essentially, complex four does contribute to the uh, electron gradient, okay? So complex four actually generates two hydrogens, okay? So we have that complex four generates, generates uh, two hydrogens into the gradient. Some people call it the proton gradient, some people call it the pH gradient, because remember, pH is just a measurement of hydrogens, right? And so if you measure the amount of hydrogens in the gradient, technically that is a pH gradient. I personally call it the hydrogen gradient, it just makes more sense. So we can call that into the uh, hydrogen gradient. Some people call it the uh, electron gradient, it's fine too, because it has a, a charge. And so, let's kind of recap. We have complex one, we have uh, complex three, and then we also have complex four, right? Of course we have complex two, but it doesn't contribute to the um, electron gradient. It just links the TCA cycle to the electron transfer uh, cycle, okay? so. It doesn't contribute. This one only produces uh, four hydrogens, right? These guys produce four hydrogens as well. Excuse me. So complex three. And then complex four only produces two hydrogens. So in total, in total, all of them make 10 hydrogens, right? So 10 hydrogens. Pretty cool. And that is. per uh, NADH2, oh, excuse me, NADH and FADH2, right? So if on the exam they were to ask, you know, how many hydrogens are generated uh, for every NADH and FADH2 combo? Well, whenever you have these two guys, you only need two molecules. Whenever they react in the, comp uh, in the uh, complexes, they're going to generate 10 hydrogens, okay? So four hydrogens are generated in complex one, uh, four hydrogens are, comp are, are generated in complex three, and two hydrogens are generated in complex four. Remember that complex uh, two and complex one, they're actually connected via uh, ubiquinone, so we're going to call that coenzyme Q, and then complex, uh, well, yeah, they're, they're uh, connected and they're going to give their electrons via coenzyme Q. And then um, complex three is connected to complex four via cytochrome C. See? And so these are essentially the mobile electron uh, carriers. They are acting as taxis, right? And they actually act as electron sources. So that is essentially the summarization of what I just said. So here's a nice little picture of what I just did, right? So NADH reacts with uh, complex one to produce NAD, 
and it's going to produce four hydrogens. FADH2 is generated, right, and is going to react with uh, complex two to just supply electrons, right? And then is going to um, react with complex three to produce four hydrogens. And over here we have another reaction that is occurring in complex four and it generates two hydrogens, okay? So that is kind of like the big picture of what we just covered, right? So we are creating the uh, gradient, right? So let's kind of go into detail about why we're creating this electron gradient because we're almost done with this uh, topic. What we're doing is that we are creating a positive charge right here. So as the hydrogens collect in this intermembrane space, they are generating positive charges, right? So we have a lot of positive charges. Inside the matrix, we have negative charges. And so we have this strong difference of charges, right? And that creates the voltage. So because there is a different charge on the outside than there is on the inside, that creates an electron gradient. And we can use the energy in the gradient to create ATP. So it's essentially like creating a battery, right? So we have a, a Duracell battery that can uh, supply energy, right? And so whenever we charge the battery up, we can use that battery to do reactions. We can use that battery to power a machine. In this case, we will use the energy in the um, intermembrane space to supply the ATP synthase machine, as I like to call it, because really it needs the hydrogens as an energy source, right? So again, the hydrogens are going to act as a battery, and we're going to insert the hydrogens into the ATP synthase, which is not shown here, and we will create ATP, okay? So it's very, very cool. Another way that it could be said is that the outside is going to be acidic, and the inside is going to be alkaline. So if you're doing an experiment, it says, well, the environment is alkaline, you can say that it's really negative. But if the environment is acidic, it's going to be really positive. But let's talk about why we're using hydrogens, right? So I kind of dipped into it a little bit, like two minutes ago, I guess. But let's talk about it. So this is actually the basis of chemio-osmotic hypothesis right and so that was proposed by Peter Mitchell in uh, the 1960s and he actually got a uh, Nobel Prize for it in 1978 which I think is kind of kind of cool because it's very simple when you think about it. Um, it when you look at the big picture I should say whenever it's in a greater detail which we will cover um, it's more complicated but it's cool and so essentially you're gonna have this uh, this build up of energy because you're you you're essentially building up hydrogens right and so whenever you build up hydrogens in the intermembrane space the amount of energy that is um produced increases right and so the energy can actually be denoted as delta p where delta p is the proton gradient um proton gradient right so this is the uh, proton motive force right so this is the proton motive force. Okay, and what that means is that as the amount of hydrogens increase, the amount of force that the hydrogens can go back into the matrix increases, right? Because look, you have some hydrogens floating around here, right? You have some hydrogens, whatever. But over here, you have a lot of hydrogens. You have like a trillion hydrogens. Let's say over here, you only have like two, right? And so the ATP synthase is going to act like a little channel and the hydrogens from the intermembrane space are going to passively diffuse into the matrix, right? Because again, in science classes, you learn that um, passive diffusion is when a higher gradient diffuses into a lower gradient. High energy goes into low energy. So a trillion hydrogens want to go into the area where there's only two hydrogens, so they become equal. Right? And so 
the force of which the hydrogen will diffuse back into the matrix is going to be called delta P, where that is called the proton motive force. Now, ATP synthase needs to use the force generated, okay, because this is pure energy. And ATP is like a machine, ATP synthase, I, I mean. So ATP synthase is like a machine and it needs energy. It gets the energy from the proton motive force and then it's going to use that energy to create ATP. So over here, you're gonna have ADP plus PI and they're gonna react with the ATP synthase. There's a better picture and I'll show you that later. So it's going to react with the ATP synthase this is turned on by the flow of hydrogens and it will actually do a reaction with ADP and the phosphate group and this creates ATP okay so literally <laughs> it's so ridiculous like the TCA cycle is just creating um, the electron carriers or it, sorry the electron um, yeah the electron carriers and the electron carriers go through the complexes to create hydrogens and then those hydrogens are going to be acting as batteries for a machine that creates ATP so everything is kind of ridiculous but it's so elegant and so beautiful and so now we will get into uh, ATP synthase and so now now we talk about the machine right so this is the ATP synthase this is called ATP synthase. Now, look at this. You have two portions of ATP synthase. You're going to have the F1 portion and you're going to have the F0 portion. Now, the F0 por portion, let's call this F0, that's equal to the stalk. Okay, so that's the stalk uh, portion. Now, you need to know that ATP synthase is a huge, it's a ginormous. Like it's like, it's like a, the Empire State Building of um, transmembrane proteins. It's absolutely ginormous, right? And it uses the stalk and knob, um, kind of. Well, people they they call it the stalk and knob picture, right? So they have the uh, knob and stalk um, structure, right? Because the knob right here, this is actually, as you will see uh, later on, this actually turns, it twists. So F sub zero is the stalk, and therefore F sub one is going to be the knob, okay? So that is the knob of it. And F sub zero, that is gonna be acting as a hydrogen pore. And that's very important, super important. So we can say important. And it's important because the hydrogens are going to enter the pore, right? So they're going to be diffusing back into the matrix because we have a lot of hydrogens right here, right? And so they're going to enter the pore of the F sub zero, and that is going to trigger a reaction that twists the knob. And whenever it twists the knob, the ADP and the phosphate group can react with the knob and create ATP, right? So it's essentially going to be using that energy. Okay, and so um, the F sub zero is going to be made of four subproteins, right? So F, F sub zero is made from four subproteins, and they're made from A1, B2, and we have C9, and also C12. And actually, uh, this isn't really a good picture. I'll, I'll get a better picture um, later. But essentially, the C proteins, the C subunits, they actually make a cylindrical shape. Okay, so this is actually a cylindrical shape. Right, so in 3D, this will be a cylindrical shape, like a Pringles can, and that is made from the C9 and C12 uh, subunits. Now we will be talking about uh, kind of like the F1 portion of the ATP synthase. And th these are some pretty good uh, photos that I found, okay? So this is the ATP synthase, right? And I wanted to show you kind of like the 3D structure, okay? So this uh, r purple cylinder that you see here is created from the C subunits, okay? So these are going to be uh, accepting hydrogens, and the hydrogens is going to activate this axle, okay? And the axle is kind of like the little rod that spins. 
this axle is made from uh, gamma units and epsilon units. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the F1 portion, right? So the F1 portion is kind of like the, um, the knob of it, right? So this is like the door handle, and the knob is what's going to be twisting, right? So over there, uh, the knob is made from the, um, well, it's made from alpha 3, uh, beta 3, um, it's also made from gammas, and I don't know how to draw gammas that well, so that's gamma, uh, epsilons, and deltas. So let's draw epsilon, right? And this is going to be a delta, and it is like this, okay? So that's how I draw my s's for some reason, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Pretty cool, it's like a little musical note. Anyways, so alpha 3 and beta 3. So obviously, for the F1, you can kind of consider there are three alpha units. Notice on the F1 portion, not this portion right here, but the F1 portion, there are three alpha units. So the alpha units here are, are in blue. So here's one right here, there's another one in the back, and there's another one right here. And then there are beta units as well. Now, it's important for you to remember that the beta units are the ones that are going to be producing ATP. So ATP is produced in the beta unit, okay? The alpha unit just kind of helps it turn a little bit. But whenever hydrogens are put into the uh, the C unit, right, in the F sub zero, the gammas and the epsilons are activated. And it is this that turns the knob, okay? So this these two guys turn the knob, okay? But if you want to be more specific, we're gonna be looking at the gamma subunit. Okay, so the gamma subunit is the one that turns the knob. The epsilon is just kind of like for reinforce, reinforcement, right? So it doesn't like, well, you don't want it to be breaking down. So the epsilon is offering some stability to the structure. The gamma one is the one that turns the knob. And the epsilon comes into, uh, into play later on. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay? So essentially, um, well, we can talk about how many hydrogens it takes to make ATP. Right? So about three hydrogens are needed to create ATP, right? So we can say that three hydrogens, whenever it's placed into the ATP thensase, is going to give you ATP, right? So we can say that one ATP. So if you're taking you know an advanced biochemistry class let's say it's an honors course um, sometimes they want you to know about inhibitors so a typical inhibitor for the atp synthase is going to be oligo oligomycin and all it does is that oligomycin blocks this pore right so it blocks the f sub zero unit and now hydrogens well they can't enter they cannot enter the pore anymore because it's being blocked by the oligomycin. So this one is acting as an inhibitor to the ATP synthase. And if this is blocked, then ATP cannot be created, and therefore the body slowly sh uh, begins to shut down because you cannot generate ATP, right? So uh, to recap, the F sub one unit is made from alpha three, beta three, gamma, epsilon, and delta subunits. The uh, beta subunits, they actually make ATP, the alpha sub units help to turn the uh, the head or the knob. The gamma subunit twists the head, and the epsilon provides kind of like stability to the uh, gamma, right? And delta is going to come into uh, process later on in a few moments. So whenever hydrogens are entering the F zero subunit. It, well, it activates kind of like the C subunit proteins, right? And the, well, they begin to turn, okay? So this right here, this one right here is going to be called the rotor, right? So this is called the rotor because it rotates. Okay, so this is the rotor. Now, if the rotor is turning this way, the gamma units are actually going to turn the other way, okay? So they turn this way, right? So they go here. So if I'm turning counterclockwise for my F0, 
the gamma ones, the gamma units are going to turn counterclockwise. Okay, and so in total, this whole unit is going to turn that way, and essentially it is this turning motion that generates ATP. Okay, and so all that happens whenever the hydrogens are entering the pore is that they're binding to the uh, C subunits, and that gives it power to rotate. And whenever it rotates, it's generating this motion. And now ADP and also a phosphate group can bind to the head, and when it rotates, it's going to release ATP. And we're going to talk about this in detail in a few moments. Okay, but the stator is essentially kind of like the the head of it. The stator is made up from the alpha units, the beta units and this delta unit, okay? So it's not the alpha and beta units of the head, but it's rather to the side of it, right? And that kind of just offers stability to the mechanism, right? If we didn't have this uh, guard right here, you would have this kind of like swaying motion. So as the head rotates, it would sway side to side, and that isn't stable, right? You want everything to be structurally sound. So we have this guard rail, kind of like a guard rail, that is made from delta units, uh, beta units, alpha units, and we call that the uh, stator. Okay, so very, very, very cool stuff. And so, if you want kind of like a flow chart, you can just say hydrogens flow, and that causes the C units to rotate, which then uh, causes the gamma units to rotate. That makes the conformational change. And we're going to talk about the conformational change in a little bit. I may even show an animation. Uh, so I'm very excited for that. And then afterward, that produces ATP. And we are good. Now we will be talking about the process of how ADP and phosphate groups are turned into ATP, right? So what you're seeing here is essentially a top view of the ATP synthase. And, and so this one right here is actually the F1 subunit or I guess portion of the synthase, on the bottom of it would have to be the F sub zero uh, portion of the ATP synthase. But right now we're just focusing on this. Now notice what we're looking at are going to be the beta subunits, okay? So this is beta three, right? So this is a beta site, and this is a beta site, and this is also a beta site, okay? So the beta sites are the most important portion because they actually generate ATP. Now you're probably wondering, well, you know, why are there letters, why is it, letter T, letter O, letter L. Well, right here we have three uh, types of betas, right? We have beta O, we have uh, beta uh, L, and then we also have beta T. Now what these letter means is that this one is going to be open, this is going to be uh, loose right here. Let's fix that. And this one is going to be tight. So we can say beta open, or we can say loose beta, tight beta, etc. And so what happens here is that whenever hydrogen enters ATP synthase, it twists the gamma. And when the gamma twists, it starts generating energy to this F1 head, right? And this F1 head is going to be turning around. And as it turns around, it's going to be generating ATP. Now the first step to generating ATP is going to be on the open. So beta open, or I guess open beta, is going to be accepting the ADP and the phosphate group. Okay, so now it's going to enter this um, this beta subunit. Okay, as the alpha unit, sorry, as <laughs> as the alpha, as the gamma unit turns, this little head kind of. Well, it twists, right? And as it twists, it's going to convert the beta open into beta loose, okay? So let's just call that BL. So again, first the ADP and the phosphate group attach itself to the BL. Now, as the gamma uh, subunit turns, 
the BL is going to be converted into BL. So now the open one is going to kind of close a little bit, just a little bit, and it's going to loosely hold the ADP and the phosphate group. Now, as we turn the gamma, the gamma subunit again, the BL is going to be converted into BT, right? So look, the BT has changed, right? Or I guess the BL has changed into BT. But as it converts into BL to BT, ATP is going to be formed, okay? Now, if we turn the uh, gamma subunit again to the original starting position, the BT is going to be converted into BO. And during that, the tightness is going to relax and it's going to be opened. And when it's opened, ATP is going to be released. So if you just focus on one subunit at a time, it makes sense. Don't look at the big picture here. Look at a very specific detail. So if we look over here, if we start here, the opened released an ATP, right? So it released an ATP. If we convert it into BL, well, now, well, let's kind of go back. As the ATP is released, ADP also enters because this one is opened. Now, as we turn the gamma subunit again, the BO is, is converted into BL, and it's going to loosely hold the ADP and the phosphate group. And as it turns again, the BL is converted into BT, and therefore it is converted into ATP. If you turn it again, the BT is converted into BO, releases the ATP, and accepts a ADP and a phosphate group. So again, that is pretty cool right there. So that's ATP. And how this is changed is uh, through enzymes. Okay, so an enzyme is actually converting the subunits, right? So it converts BL to BT, BT to BL, BL to BL, etc. But let's look at a little animation. This is a nice little animation created by St. Olaf College and in it we are going to be seeing the beta subunit and the gamma subunit okay uh, here this would be your open state so this is o here would be the uh, loose phase so this is l and this is the uh, tight phase so this is t right but notice that you're going to be generating atp at every turn okay so in every turn there is atp being generated and you can see it uh, in the step Right. So again, they're just showing you that this is the relaxed state and this is the gamma state. So right here, the ADP and the phosphate group, they go into the open um, subunit. The open one is going to be converted into a loose um, conformation, right? And the loose conformation is going to hold it uh, very loosely, right? Now the loose conformation is, is um, converted into a tight conformation and the tight conformation actually generates ATP. Now when the ATP is generated, it will convert it into the open um, subunit. And now the open subunit is going to release ATP and it will convert itself back into uh, the loose subunit after ADP and a phosphate group go into this subunit. Okay, so let's actually see this animated, right? Uh, it happens very quickly and you can see that ATP is going to be generated at every turn. So look, ATP is being generated, it's going to be here, and then there, and it just keeps doing that. So you can see that this is very efficient. And at the bottom of this, you're actually going to see kind of like hydrogen uh, flowing into the uh, pores, right? So the F sub zero is supplying hydrogens and is going to be converted into what? Into ATP and the F sub one uh, portion of ATP synthase. So hopefully that showed you how um, ATP is generated via ATP synthase using the hydrogen gradient, right? So that was pretty cool. So thank you, St. Olaf College, for making that animation. So let's talk about the regulation of the electron transport chain. So what is regulating the ETC? The ETC, the electron transport chain, is regulated by the presence of ATP, or uh, ADP, sorry, by the levels of ADP, okay? So now this means that if there's a little bit of ADP, then there's gonna be a lot of ATP, and we don't really need to do respiration, right? We don't need to do mitochondrial respiration. But if there's a large amount of ADP, we need to do mitochondrial respiration. So lots of 
lots of ADP equals uh, lots of respiration needed. And so this is actually going to drive a lot of reactions, right? So if we don't have a lot of ATP, we're gonna need to do some more glycogen phosphorylase, we need to do uh, more FUFRO, uh, we need to do uh, more phosphofructokinase reactions and citrate synthase, right? So a lot of reactions depend on the amount of ADP. Okay, so gly uh, glycolysis depends on it, uh, the TCA cycle depends on it, ETC cycle depends on it, almost every reaction depends on the presence of ADP. So this picture is going to show the active transport. This is the active active transport of ATP and ADP. So recall that whenever we're making ATP synthase, we have this membrane, right? So we have this membrane and there's going to be like this little ATP synthase, right? Over here we have ADP and a phosphate group. And they're gonna to react to form ATP. Okay, well, this is the matrix. And this right here is the intermembrane space, right? So these, the uh, intermembrane. So let's see, membrane. Space. And of course, there's a bunch of hydrogen atoms right here, whatever, right? Well, first of all, after we made ATP, we need to transfer the ATP back into the intermembrane space so that it could be transported throughout the body. Okay, so we need to uh, put ATP into a low concentration, right? So, to do this, we need to have kind of like a, a balance, right? Because look, ADP is also outside here, right? So ADP is outside, but it needs to get inside. So to do this, we have to use kind of like a membrane transporter. So ADP is on the outside, we have to get it inside, so we have to transport it here. ATP is in the inside, but we have to get it outside, right? So it has to be here. That's what it's showing in this picture. ATP is being created in the matrix, but we want it to be in the intermembrane space. So we have to use a, a membrane transporter to transport the ATP from the matrix to the membrane space. Likewise, the ADP has to be placed into the matrix for, for, it, to be, um, for it to be able to generate ATP. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, of course, we're gonna be using some membranes, but specifically, we're gonna be using adenine so we use adenine uh, nucleotide. So we have nucleotide translocase, translocase. And adenine uh, nucleotide translocase is just going to be uh, transporting the ADP into the matrix and the ATP into the membrane space. But of course, that is an issue. Why is that? Well, ATP has three phosphates, right? And therefore, it's going to have a charge of negative four. But whenever ADP is transported, it's going to have a charge of negative three. So we actually lost a negative, right? We lost a negative right there. We became more positive. So in order to offset the change of positivity, we're going to also use a membrane right here and have some hydrogens leak in to the matrix as well. Okay, so that is what it's showing. And so you can say that ADP is symport to hydrogen. Symport means just to go in the same direction. Notice that ADP is also going into the matrix. That is the same thing that hydrogen is doing. Hydrogen is also going into the matrix. Therefore, ADP is symport to hydrogen, okay? And you can say that ADP is uh, ACE import to ATP. That means that they go in different directions. ADP, well, yeah, ADP is going into the matrix. ATP is going into the membrane. So therefore, they are symport. So this is uh, ACE import. 
right there, right? So to recap, uh, ADP is going to be placed into the matrix, ATP is going to be placed out of the matrix. Uh, they have a loss of one electron, and so we need to have an electron being transported into the matrix to make up for that. That is why we have a hydrogen being placed into the matrix via the adenine nucleotide uh, translocase protein. We will now be talking about uh, the PO ratio. So we have the PO ratio, right? So it's pretty cool because it rhymes, right? But essentially it's how many, um, it's how many molecules of ADP, so molecules of ADP phosphorylated divided by the amount of atoms of oxygen reduced, right? So amount of O2 reduced. Now, recall that for ATP synthase, that little machine requires three hydrogens for every uh, ATP produced, right? So ATP synthase needs three hydrogens per ATP produced. But as you saw in the last slide, whenever ATP is produced, we need to get it out of the matrix into the um, inner membrane, right? So to do that, we need to have an additional hydrogen for it to do that um, transportation, okay? So to transport ATP, to transport ATP, one hydrogen is needed. And so to create one ATP molecule, in total, we need four hydrogens. So four hydrogens are needed to create one ATP. So three of them, three hydrogens are needed to generate an ATP, and then one additional hydrogen is needed to transport that ATP. So therefore, we can say that four hydrogens are needed to create one ATP. Now, let's put this all together. We call that in complex one, three, and four. So we can say complex one, three, and four. They make four hydrogens, right? So they make four hydrogens and two hydrogens. So in total, 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 plus 2 is 10, so in total 10 hydrogens are made, right, per NADH and FADH2, right? So if we take that and we divide it by how many hydrogens, uh, sorry, and we divide it by how many hydrogens are needed to create one ATP, which is 4, we can get a ratio, okay? And that ratio is about uh, 2.5 ATP. ATP generated per oxygen, okay, per oxygen, or per NADH and FADH2. So these two are connected, okay? So I'm not saying, oh, if you have one FADH2, then it's going to generate, you know, 2.5 ATP. No, it's one NADH paired with one FADH2 because together they are needed to do the reaction. You can't do a, re a, a reaction just using one and not the other. They have to be both used, okay? So if we were to um, generate using C2, uh, C3, and C4, complex four, well, this again generates nothing. This generates four hydrogens, and this generates two hydrogens, right? And so again, this will be eight hydrogens right here. So four plus two, I don't know where I'm doing this math. It's actually six, my gosh, that's embarrassing, right? So six hydrogens uh, divided by four hydrogens right there. And that should give you about 1.5 1.5 uh, ATP, okay? So if you were to do it in complex three and four. 
So let's step back and let's kind of assess what happened. Of course, NADH and FADH2 are both needed to do a reaction. But hypothetically, if you were to just look at NADH alone, you can say, okay, well, NADH is going to give you about 2.5 ATP per oxygen, right? And then FA. DH2 is going to give you about 1.5 ATP per oxygen because NADH goes into complex 1 and is going to be connected via ubiquinone um, into complex 3 and then from complex 3 it's going to use uh, cytochrome C to be connected into complex 4. So NADH goes to complex 1, 3, and 4 and that generates 10 hydrogens. Then you divide it by 4 hydrogens to get 2.5 ATP. Now FADH2 only goes to uh, complex 2, 3, and 4, but only complex 3 and 4 generate ATP. So now you're going to have, uh, sorry, they generate hydrogens. So now you're going to have 6 hydrogens generated from complex 3 and 4, and you're going to divide it by 4 hydrogens to give you 1.5 ATP. So for every one uh, FADH2 molecule, you're going to get 1.5 ATP uh, atoms or molecules. And then for every one NADH molecule, you're going to get 2.5 ATPs. Now, let's say that you're going to be taking the MCAT or you're going to be taking an honors course in biochemistry. Or maybe you're a biochemistry major. Well, you would have to know about the respiratory inhibitors and the uncouplers. So this portion is going to be focusing on the inhibitors and the uncouplers. So for complex 1, the inhibitors, so complex 1 inhibitors, It's going to be um, Rtone. So, sorry. So we have the uh, rot rotenone. It's weird to say. So rotenone is going to be an uh, inhibitor, and also barbiturates, right? So barbiturates. So both uh, rotenone and barbiturates are going to be inhibitors to the C1 complex, or to the first complex. Now complex three, right here, that's going to be inhibited by something called anti-mycin A. And then complex four is actually more, um, more common, right? So you might actually see some inhibitors that you, that you actually know. Right, so for instance, cyanide, right? So cyanide is going to um, kill you, but it attacks complex four. Uh, you have azide or azide. And then we also have carbon monoxide. So for instance, if someone is inhaling a, um, too many exhaust fumes from a car, they could get carbon monoxide poisoning. And carbon monoxide actually inhibits the complex four pathway. Okay, so these are the inhibitors right here. Uh, now we will be talking about uncouplers, and uncouplers are actually kind of interesting if you want to research them or study them, right? So uncouplers. Uh, what uncouplers do is that they mess, they mess around with the ATP synthase, right? So they're gonna uncouple some subunits so that the machine doesn't function as properly, okay? So you're still gonna have rotation in the ATP synthase, but that rotation is not gonna generate ATP, okay? So why is that important? Well, it's important because if the ATP keeps spinning and, and generating energy, well, it's still going to accept hydrogens, right? Because this is not blocked. It's going to accept hydrogens, and then it's going to accept oxygens as well. So we have oxygen is going to go here. Now this guy is spinning, and this guy is also spinning, but ATP is not being generated, okay? ATP is not generated, okay? And we're going to draw an angry face because that is not cool, right? So this can actually be very lethal in humans, right, or in animals if, if it's not controlled, right? So let's say that you have a uh, disorder in your body and your body does not generate ATP. It actually has a lot of uncouplers, right? Well, that means that your oxygen is being used up. So oxygen 
is being used up. But no ATP is being generated. So if oxygen is being used up, then uncouplers, therefore, they must, they must stimulate oxidation, right? So uncouplers stimulate oxidation. Uh, but before we get into that, we have to define what an uncoupler is. So an uncoupler is actually a lipid-soluble weak acid, but it can also exist in the system as a weak acid or a weak base, right? So this is kind of like a lipid-soluble lipid -soluble, uh, weak acid or base. So you can actually inject uncouplers into a system and see that ATP is not going to be produced. However, the oxygen is still being used up and the hydrogens are being pushed into the matrix, right? So we're going to be pushing the hydrogens from the inner molecular membrane into the uh, matrix, right? But uncouplers do not affect the uh, electron transport chain. So uncouplers do not affect the electron transport chain. Okay, so everything functions normally. Everything is normal except you are not creating ATP. So you're probably wondering, well, what what am I making? If I'm not making ATP or are we just what what are we doing? Well instead of ATP, heat heat is going to be produced. Okay, so heat is produced. Well, think about it, that's kind of beneficial if only a little bit of uncouplers are, are made. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, companies they actually try to abuse uncouplers in your body, okay? So those diet pills that some people take, those pills are filled with uncouplers. And when you ingest those pills, they go into the system and they put the uncouplers on the ATP synthase. So instead of making ATP, you start creating heat, and that heat raises your metabolism. So now you start burning more calories. Now fats and carbohydrates and proteins are more oxidized, right? They become easily oxidized. And you might think, oh, you know, that's pretty cool. I, I want that to happen. I want to have some uncouplers in my system. But notice that when you, whenever you have uncouplers in your system, you do not have as much ATP being generated. And so that's why uh, diet pills um, that have uncouplers they actually make you feel more tired, they make you feel more drowsy, and that's because you're not creating ATP. Now, there are some downsides to uh, ingesting diet pills. Of course, your hands become shaky, you become tired, um, your eyes become droopy, and there's a lot of you know side effects to taking diet pills. So I don't recommend that you take diet pills, okay? Because we actually have naturally occurring uncouplers in our bodies, and we should not change that. So let's actually talk about the natural uncouplers. So as you may have already known, uh, gizmo is a mammal. So gizmo actually has, um, you know, are the same, some of the same features as our bodies. And in his body, he has brown tissues. And brown tissue, they essentially have, uh, they're, they're fats, right? And these fats have a lot of mitochondria. Now these mitochondria, they have ATP synthase, but in brown fats, the ATP synthase is completely uncoupled, okay? So in his body, you know, he has mitochondria that are not uncoupled. They actually, you know, create ATP, but only in the brown tissue are all the mitochondria uncoupled, okay? So the purpose of the uncoupled um, mitochondria is to create ATP, uh, sorry, is to create heat. So this creates heat. Let's, let's write that better. Right, so whenever he's cold, you know, whenever he's sleeping um, in his bed and he's cold, his brown fat, his, well, his brown tissues, they actually uh, pull in more oxygen, they pull in more hydrogen, and with those hydrogens and oxygens, they create heat, 
and they keep his body warm. He does burn a little bit more calories whenever he's cold, but overall it keeps him warm. Now, if you want a real world example, uh, brown bears, whenever they hibernate, they're relying on their brown tissues to uh, convert uh, energy into heat, and that keeps them warm. Of course, some of the um, brown tissues, they're filled, they're filled with uh, thermogen. Okay, so this one right here, so brown tissues, are filled, filled with thermogen, thermogen, genin, thermogenin, okay, and that allows us uh, to uncouple mitochondria and create heat. And so uh, that is the end of biochemistry. So that is all that I'm that I will be teaching you uh, for this semester and I hope that you know you learned so much uh, in my lectures and I hope that you enjoyed the cameos that um, featured <laughs> uh, Gizmo, you know my little friend, my sponsor. So it was an honor to teach you and it was an honor to be able to share some of the knowledge that I had with you. And thank you so much for watching these videos and for spending time with me. Um, I hope that you did learn something and that my jokes were actually kind of funny and kept you entertained. So remember that I do believe in you and that you can do well on your exams and in life. Thank you so much for watching my videos. It means the world and I love you. Goodbye and be safe. Thank you.